Hey kids, howdy, and welcome to this week's episode of Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. It is March 11th, <laughs> second week in March. We are moving through a, a quiet week before eclipse season. So we're like, you know, this is the, you know, we had a new moon yesterday and we've got uh, uh, eclipses starting in about a, a week plus. So it's a relatively quiet week, but we are, make no mistake about it, we are in a rock'em sock'em lunar cycle that started yesterday. So I'll, I'll chat a little bit about that when we get going in the astrology. But first, let's answer a question. This is from Haley, who writes, Hey, Michael, I'm wondering more about when two planets conjunct each other, how their energies interact and then how that affects the aspecting of one's personal planets. She says, apologies, I'm sure that could have been worded better. No, I thought that was worded just fine. Like, what, what's the impact of two planets coming together, and how, therefore, would they impact making contact with your chart? For example, and I love that she brings this example up because there's something happening this spring that's pretty, pretty big conjunction, Jupiter and Uranus coming together. So she says, for example, with Jupiter and Uranus moving towards conjunction in April, how do you interpret the synergy of them coming together? Uh, I'm not going to refer to the specific thing in her chart that she refers to because I don't do that on the pod. But if you're listening, Haley, you can, you can, <laughs> you can do the, the uh, association on your own. And then she says, until I can take your classes, I'm so thankful for you answering a weekly question. I love learning from you every Monday. Well, I love that. And she says, thank you for being rad. <laughs> I'm rad. <laughs> thank you, Haley. So I actually love that, 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 that Haley brings up a specific conjunction that's coming up this spring that's actually a big deal for the year. And it just gives me an opportunity to answer this question, but also have it somewhat be focused on something that all of us will be moving through in the next like month or so. So when I'm working in, say, a session and talking about a conjunction like this impacting someone's chart, my approach is to build foundationally with my thoughts. And so I will use this phrase in, a, in sessions all the time. I use the phrase, in a vacuum. Right. So what right, that means is if I'm talking about something that Jupiter's doing to your chart and I talk about something that Uranus is doing to your chart, I will speak of them as separate at first and say, well, in a vacuum, Jupiter transiting your chart and getting ready to conjunct Uranus is going to bring expansion, bounty, a sense of possibility, all of the yummy uh, beautiful things that Jupiter trucks with is always about the way life on the planet can be, you know, yummy and delicious. So in a vacuum, a Jupiter transit based on the geometry uh, 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 that you would interpret would be about expansion, bounty, and seeing the world through the lens of incredible possibility. Uranus in a vacuum would be about the sudden, the unexpected, the pivots, the reversals, the way in which you get shocked and surprised by something you didn't see coming. So similarly, we would interpret a Uranus transit based on the geometry that was being held. It might be positive or negative. A square is difficult, a trine is more flowing. But in a vacuum, Uranus would be all about sudden change, that ultimately, archetypally, is supposed to wake us up to a higher level of awareness, which is why we call Uranus the Great Awakener. The reason I do this is because it's, it would be impossible to understand the blending of Jupiter and Uranus unless you're understanding the parts that they each bring to the mix. So we start with separating them. So if you're listening to this and learning from this, both you, Haley, and anybody else, 
anytime you're interested in what's going to happen when two planets conjunct, first start by separating out what one brings and what the other brings so that when it comes time to combining them, you've already clearly established in your mind what's the ingredient from that planet, what's the ingredient from that planet, then it becomes more natural to create the recipe of what happens when they bring, you know, when, when they conjoin. There's always going to be an emphasis on the faster planet as having a little more emphasis with regard to what the outcome of form might be. The, the transiting planet has more action into it. So as those movements reflect us, because Jupiter is so much faster than Uranus, them coming together, Jupiter transiting through a conjunction with Uranus puts a little more emphasis on the transiting planet's participation. And so in this case, it would be the presence of or the possibility of new expansive possibilities that come out of nowhere that might knock you on your ass, but that are ultimately about expanding possibility and rising up to a higher level of conscious awareness. So you can then apply this to any conjunction you want to explore. You look at each planet's separate consciousness first so that it's easier to understand what might happen when they blend. And then you add a little extra emphasis on the faster moving planet as being the one who's guiding the proceedings. And in this case, it's Jupiter transiting Uranus. So it's about as we expand and move into more possibility, we are also met by sudden and exciting possibilities that come out of nowhere that then help us move forward. And that's an element that's happening in April. Stay tuned each week for when we get there, and I'll be talking all about it. So on the one hand, it's a quieter week, but <laughs> what I should really say, what's more accurate, it's a quiet episode, right? Because it is not a quiet week. We are in a rock'em, sock'em lunar cycle that started yesterday, and just so happens that we, you know, I stopped the week's conversation at Sunday, and we pick it up on a Monday, and so since the new moon was yesterday— Talking about it is not exactly in today's podcast outline, so then it's like, well, there's less to talk about, but we have already begun the lunar cycle that includes our next eclipse season. And so even though the new moon was yesterday, are we still feeling those effects because it's like a wild lunar cycle, or are we still in oh, the vibe? Oh, I, well, you know, not even because it's a wild. There's a great... Great question, though, because yes, in fact, I would say every lunation, you can expect to sort of have a three-day influence. You know, often it's like the day before the day of and the day after. So we're still in the new moon thrust. I mean, the moon moved into Aries last night, you know, around 5 p.m. Pacific time. So we're out of the technical window because the moon's no longer in Pisces. But man, we're in the thrust of the new moon absolutely yesterday, today, and into even tomorrow. And it's the lunar cycle that includes eclipse season. So even if this particular week from the dates I'm, you know, talking about March 11th through the 17th are a little less trafficy than yesterday and what's coming next week, we are in, in some ways, the wormhole that we ascribe to eclipse season already. <laughs> So what do I mean by wormhole? Uh, wormhole is a term that Stephanie Azaria first introduced me to. And I don't know if this is a Stephanie Azaria invention or if there are other astrologers who use this terminology to describe the intense passage that happens between the eclipses. But that's where I learned it. She was my first teacher 25, 30 years ago. In quantum physics, the wormhole is the idea that the fabric of time and space can sort of fold up against itself and a particle can rip through a tear in that fabric and get from one place in the universe all the way to someplace else instantaneously through this inner theoretical existence that is this thing called a wormhole. 
I also like to say we've seen, you know, uh, graphic images of this as a special effect in movies at that swirling tunnel of light and suddenly the sci-fi folks are yeah you know, go into the <laughs> tunnel and then they're off, you know, it's, right? That that that's a that's a dramatic uh, 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 representation of like a wormhole, the idea that I get from here to there instantaneously. So why we call the eclipse season a wormhole is because they are transformative. They are faded. They change us. They hurtle us from one consciousness to another consciousness faster than any typical lunar cycle because eclipses turn on the transformative power of our solar system. So for my money, I've always really just referred to the wormhole as the time between the first eclipse and the, and the last one. In this case, there are two. There are, off, there are always two, and sometimes there are three or four. Right now, there's two. So for me, the wormhole starts with, uh, with a full moon uh, uh, in the middle of the month and the new moon that's a total solar eclipse uh, in early April. So we're not in the wormhole yet in terms of like what is going to happen between the next full moon and the new moon after, which both of those are eclipses. Those two weeks are going to be wild, 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 wild. But one could also call the wormhole the entire set of lunar cycles. So that even though the eclipse is two weeks away from today, we're in the lunar cycle that includes it, wormhole open. So all of this to say it's a quiet week and it's not going to be so quiet because we are hurtling towards eclipse season. And be sure to tune in next week when we talk all about that. Something happens today at 2 p.m. Pacific time that is kind of lovely and that will absolutely help the next three and a half weeks be maybe slightly more, I don't know what the right word is, gentle, (laughs) as, as they might otherwise be. Venus is changing signs today and moving into her happy place. Venus is what's called exalted in Pisces. Exaltation is a demarcation where there's just these signs that have been thought to be fabulous homes for certain planets. Um, This comes out of Babylon. So it's old, old astrology. And I like to laugh about this because, like, we don't know why the Babylonians decided that Venus is exalted in Pisces. (laughs) <laughs> we don't. What we then know is also that she's not happy in Virgo, the opposite of her exaltation. But we don't know why any astrologers thousands of years ago decided that Venus is exalted here. But once you look at the archetypal makeup, it makes complete sense. Venus is how we know love. Whether we're talking about love with a small L that we feel in our hearts for other people or life itself, or love with a capital L, divine love, where we know that we are held by a universe while brutal is still a loving place to have existence. And without Venus, we don't have connection to love, okay? So there are 12 signs, and Venus operates differently in each one of them. That's the truth of all planets, and moving through signs, that's that's a fundamental of astrology. And Pisces is the place where there are no limits, there are no borders, there are no uh, blockages to connection. It's where we are all one. It's where the universal mind was invented, or the unconscious mind, if you will. I'm training myself to stop saying unconscious mind and use the term universal mind, because really, when I say the word unconscious, I mean a place that is not only the psychological unconscious where things are crazy down below the surface, but also where inspiration comes from, intuitive guidance, and our sense of flow. That to me is the unconscious, but uh, a universal mind is a little more like a modern shamanistic way of, of, of uh, describing I haven't heard that. that one. So in Pisces, well, I was doing a panel discussion with a lovely woman who's a kind of an urban shaman. This woman in her like late 70s, she was just beautiful. And she used that word. And I was like, oh, God, I think I need to like modernize my approach a little. But it is in Pisces that that universal mind is what we hmm. are. Yeah. 
right? It's the last sign yeah. of the zodiac, which means we come back to connection to all, and then we burst through over the threshold between Pisces and Aries. We call that the birth canal of the of the zodiac. So we are in Pisces season. So Venus moving into Pisces is very aligned with the season that we're in because sun still being in Pisces means that we're consciously aware of the connection, the universal mind, the way that we are all one. You know, forgiveness and compassion is easy in Pisces because if you and I are one and I reach out and I hurt you, then I am hurting myself. And the principle of compassion and empathy and forgiveness is all about that. Venus will be here for three and a half weeks. That's how long she stays in every sign unless she's got a retrograde coming up. Um, and so for the rest of the month and into um, the beginning of April, our feeling bodies will be more forgiveness aligned. We will feel the love is love is love is love kind of sensation is possible. If you move through the world with challenges with boundaries and codependency, Venus in Pisces is not going to be your friend necessarily unless you show up kind of knowing, uh-oh, I got to ground in my boundaries because I'm going to feel like we're all so one and connected and loving that I don't need to protect myself. And that's not a good idea for some of y'all. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and part... Yeah, right, right. So it's like there's there's shadows of everything right. and the shadow of formlessness and boundarylessness is is that all kinds of shit can go down when you don't have a sense of where I end mm -hmm. and you begin. Pisces tells us that there is no disconnection before between where I end mm -hmm. and you begin, but we cannot operate in that way. That's why we have a mind that separates us. Mm -hmm. That, that's what Mercury is there for. Mercury tells us that you and I are separate. At least we have to operate that way through perception so that we don't bump into each other as we're going. But Venus in Pisces will make connection and lovingness and forgiveness uh, much more easy, whether that's good for you or challenging for you. Either way, that starts this afternoon. There's some interesting Venus stuff happening this week. And in the spirit of my Venus overview that I've been doing every week, when there's been something to say about Venus, I present it out to you. And this is Tuesday, Wednesday. You know, Chiron and the North Node are still very close to each other. I've been talking about this for since last summer, that Chiron and the North Node in Aries have been gathering together towards a conjunction that hit about a week and a half ago. And in fact, the eclipse season has a total eclipse in April that is conjunct Chiron himself. So I'll be talking even more about the healing from Chiron that I've been talking about for the last like nine months and the Venus stuff that's been going on that I talk about each week. And so it's interesting to me that Venus is going to semi-square both the North Node and Chiron this Tuesday and Wednesday. So that means if you've been going through any kind of a narrative in your relationship life or your healing in general. And, and again, because we're talking about Venus's movement here, it's, it's more about if you're in a relational challenge, understand that Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, you're going to bump up against a mild sense of what wounds of relationship might be keeping you from, you know, a greater experience of love. It's mild because it's a, a semi-square, but it is... Uh, uh, definitely a mark of the week that 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 some of you will be moving through something specific to your relationship healing narrative if that's been rich for you these first months of the year. There's another little transit that happens this week on Sunday that's worthy of talking about. It's one of my favorite yearly conjunctions, which is the annual meeting of the sun and Neptune. Why I love this transit is because oh. uh, uh, we are conscious awareness being centered in the sun. Like that, that's why Western astrology centers around the sun and your natal chart centers around your sun sign. The sun sign in the natal chart is thought to be your, you know, sort of inner hub of integration of all that you experience gets known by you ultimately through your sun placement. 
Neptune invented, since I'm flexing the muscle of universal mind, <laughs> Neptune invented the universal mind, the unconscious spaces, the place where inspiration comes from, where flow and intuitive guidance emerges. That's all a Neptune thing. And you can see that, therefore, Neptune is sort of opposite the sun. If the sun is our conscious awareness and Neptune is the planet that said there's a way to be aware of everything that's not consciously awareable, <laughs> if that's a word, then sun and Neptune hold those tension of opposites. So when they come together every year, there's a gorgeous opportunity to feel sort of aligned with your creations, aligned with your sense of being a conscious being, having a spiritual experience, and then co-creating with the universe <laughs> to have magnificent lives. I once, and I don't remember what the source of this was, but there was some either book or program that had language associated with certain transits. And the language that this, I think it was a book, had about the sun and Neptune coming together by conjunction was just a phrase. It was the finished masterpiece. And I love that evocative sense of like what happens when we recognize that, yes, our conscious awareness is everything because without it, we can't function here. But that if we're moving about in a conscious awareness that eradicates all of the information that comes from the mystery and the unknown places, then we're only living half a life. And so Sun and Neptune coming together by conjunction is like a reset for the whole planet to align our conscious awareness with an appreciation that it's happening inside a sea of unconscious connection. So if you ever want to ritualize an astrological moment, like I will be doing some kind of a meditative ceremony on Sunday to honor Sun and Neptune coming together. And it's not like I'm going to create some wildly sophisticated thing that is, you know, specifically honoring Sun and Neptune. No, I'm simply going to sit down at some point on Sunday and do a meditation, but lift it up as if it's a ritual. And then I'm just going to sit and meditate as I meditate, but through the intention of if the Sun and Neptune are coming together out in the solar system, and that means the conscious awareness of the collective is gathering with the universal mind of the collective, then I, in my puny little body, am going to do the same. I'm going to sit in a chair on Sunday. I'm going to put on a track or two, light some incense, maybe throw some oils on, put a little sage in the atmosphere, and just do a meditation that is natural for me to do, but through the intention of aligning with the merging of conscious awareness and unconscious power because the solar system is doing the same, I encourage you guys to do also the same and have at it. Did you know that Michael has a daily astro alert? If you enjoy hearing the weekly astrology, you might like knowing more about each day. When you subscribe for the daily astro alerts, you'll get an in-depth explanation of the day's astrology sent right to your email. Subscriptions are only $10 a month, or you can purchase the yearly subscription at the reduced price of $100. To subscribe, head over to michaelenix.com. All right, it's dream segment time. Every week, Dr. Michael will interpret dreams that are sent in via email or take a live caller. If you would like your dream interpreted on the podcast, you can go ahead and email us at dreams at michaelenix.com. Hopefully your dream will make it onto the show. Um, this week we have an email and dream from Nicole. And so Nicole says, hi there. I love listening to your daily astrology updates. It's usually the first thing I do when I pick up my phone for the day. Yay. Yeah. I appreciate your insight and would love to hear 
what your opinion of this dream is. So it goes, I am in an art class. It feels like I am back in high school. In waking reality, I am a 31-year-old woman. But I'm with adult strangers at some kind of paint and sip situation. I'm sitting towards the back of the classroom, <laughs> and it seems like class has ended. Everyone is freely chatting. I notice the person in front of me has painted a copy of a dancing moon that I have in my current bedroom. I tell her that I have it and ask if she has seen the dancing sun print that pairs with it. We politely chat and I feel a little nervous. I think it's because I'm alone and it feels like I'm trying to make friends. I then notice the woman next to me has painted a copy of a painting that I made in my waking life and have hanging in my current bedroom. I told the woman that I had done something similar and I felt an anxious wave wash over me. Looking around the classroom, I realized that all of the students had painted copies of either my own work or work of others that I currently own. I felt panicked and afraid, but don't remember anything more after that realization. It felt very unsettling, and I'd love to chat with you to try and gain some insight into what this could mean. Thank you for the work that you do. Nicole. Wow. Wow. I, I mean, yeah. I'm saying wow because, <laughs> right. like, you know, I've heard so many dreams over the years, and every once in a while, I hear a dream where it's like, mm. oh, this sounds like a story I've never heard before. You know what I mean? Something, you know, uh, this dream has a feeling of like, yeah. oh, wow, um, this is actually going to be a little bit of work. <laughs> All right. So whenever I feel that way, whenever it's like, because, you know, sometimes I hear a right. dream and the story to interpret it is already present before you've even finished, right? That's how most dreams land for me. This one doesn't. So, um, uh, uh, um, so let's, let's little. Well, let's... you know, what really sticks out for me, Michael, is that all of these things are replications of her. So I'm like, but from other people. So it's. Right. Now go a little further with that, Zoe. Who are these women in the class in her dream? Uh, stranger women like that she doesn't know, that she's maybe wants to make friends. Right. So how would you imagine I'm going to interpret them? Right. But how do you think I'm going to interpret those people? Okay. Those I'm people. Asking, yes. Are... Well, they're parts of her, right? Yes. So, so isn't it interesting that each of these parts of her have also made art that's part of her, whether it's because she appreciates it or she made it herself. And she's seeming to want to be friends with them. That's right. And is she? No. No. Is she on the other side of this desire to integrate? No. She's on the front end. Yeah. All right. So you're, I love okay. it. So thank Sorry. you. you know, doing well. <laughs> Point, I'll let you do point, your job. So get points. <laughs> that was brilliant. Right. So we're in an art class, right? So now we'll inch through. Nicole is in an art class. So there's something about learning art that the theme of the dream is. But I don't think it's about patent sipping. I don't think this is a dream about how to make, you know, Van Gogh's <laughs> Starry Starry Night come to life. <laughs> I have somewhere a copy of a very bad looking Van Gogh's Starry Starry Night that I did at a patent sip. But Art class means that Nicole is learning something, but she's not learning something that's practical or structural. She's learning something that's a little bit more artistic that, that I see healing trauma and self-investigation and integration as an artistic pursuit. I, I, I think it is. It's more creative and artistic than it is rational and practical. So for me, especially since we know where this dream goes, the art class setting says Nicole is learning something about approaching her life from a more creative and artistic place. So we've already decided that all of these strangers are aspects of self and very specifically connected to creative expression, right? Even though the dream is about a lot of these are just paintings she has because one of them is a painting she did, I'm going to extrapolate that every aspect of self that's in this dream that's associated with some painting that is 
germane to Nicole is that each one of these character aspects are some element of Nicole. They might even have some chronology, you know, where one aspect connects to when that painting came into her life. Right? She, she has this sun painting, moon painting idea, right? Well, say she, I'm making this up. I don't know when she bought that painting, but let's say she bought it 10 years ago. That person in the dream might be 10 year old, uh, not 10 year old, Nicole, but like Nicole from 10 years ago. I, I, I'm making this up. That's not terribly important. Like, I don't want Nicole to go back and dissect her dream <laughs> chronologically. I'm trying to just give a general sense yeah. of what I am seeing as I look into this classroom and all of these aspects of self that Nicole is meeting. She's attempting to be friendly with them. To me, that's the language of integration. You know, shadow work is just becoming friendly with aspects of self we are very unfriendly with, right? Like, I don't like the fact that I have enough of a temper that occasionally, if I'm triggered in the right way, still, I can yell at a level that hurts people's feelings. I'm not ashamed of that anymore, even though when it happens, it can, I can go through some shame when it occurs. But like, I don't live ashamed of that aspect of myself, but I did in the past, but I made friends with it. I don't reject it. It's not like it's not like I pretend not to be an angry person who could lose his temper because I am. <laughs> right? I'm friendly with that. So I think Nicole is having a dream where she's trying to get friendly with all sorts of aspects of herself. And the reason why every time it occurs in the dreamscape as sort of positive and unfolding, she gets nervous. And so I think the nervousness is she's at the that's why I say she's at the front end of this integration process, not at the middle or not towards the other side of it. She's just discovering that if she's creative and artistic with how she approaches living her life, that she will meet aspects of self that all are creative individually but that as they are integrated into her, imagine how brilliantly creative and stunning Nicole's creations will be when all of the inner creative aspects that right now feel a little bit split and disintegrated come together in an integrated version of Nicole where there is no longer nervousness about the aspects of self that are being gathered, but a sense of ownership of them. And the last thing I want to say is, to me, the dream tells us this process is absolutely happening right now. It's not like a, this has to happen, Nicole, or one day you might. The dream is telling us she's in an integration. It's happening. In fact, the class is over, which means the lesson's already been learned. So somehow this landscape isn't wow. about, I got to figure this out. It's like, now that I have figured something out about drawing aspects of self back together, the work of integration is the next chapter. So I say these things so that Nicole isn't hearing what I'm saying, thinking, oh, fuck, I'm not like, I'm not doing a good job. It's like, no, you're doing a great job. Class is over, lessons learned. You're already attempting to make the integration happen. That's you moving around the space, trying to be friends with all these chicks. And the nervousness is just that it's uh, it's an integrating process. It's not smooth, clean, and 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 light and breezy. You know, the process of learning, growing, self investigating, and integrating is hard fucking work. <laughs> so love this dream, Nicole. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And just imagine the stunning paintings you will make with your life as you move further and further through and into this integration moment. Thank you for listening to Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. You can find us on Apple Music, the iHeartRadio app, and anywhere you find your favorite shows. Head on over to michaellennox.com for information on astrology readings, the daily Astro Alert subscription, upcoming classes, and to join the mailing list.